Can you hear it? Welcome to Relay. Oh, why is that? Hello. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I checked everything but, uh, you know, our video, which is great because it's not like that's something we need. <laughs> Hello, everybody. You um, can't see us. And Discord, of course, is not <laughs> showing up in the Streamlabs thing. Of course not. Oh, yeah, this is good. Good start. <laughs> um, Always good start. All right, I need to grab a drink real quick while you're starting that, so I'll be right back. Ha! Oh! There's something. Ha! Got us! Hello! Hey, Mr. Darge. Hey, Mr. Sargareth. Uh, Nakara's off running to get some form of liquid, but uh, I'm here. Um, I mean, and and he'll be back in a second. Uh, it's time for another space cast. Today, we're going to be covering uh, some news, as always, and then we'll be covering uh, <coughs> Apollo. 14 and, and wait, did you darge? You probably did. And I probably just didn't change it. Hello, everybody. Um, it might've just gone into Kara. Yeah. But... I'm, I'm a bad person generally. <laughs> hey, sorry. Hey, Sorry, it's a, a little bit late this week. It's okay, Darj. We'll uh, I'll get it from Nakar and we'll use it for the next week. I just we'll, we'll it still looks okay. much better than what we had before. So, mm -hmm. um, Ooh, I, I like our title. Yeah, I thought it rhymed, and I like things that rhyme because uh, reasons. I must say, I don't allow, I don't sneeze anywhere near as loud as your significant other. No one does. Literally no one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted to start with a quote. Ooh, okay. uh, this here is a fixer-upper of a planet, but we could make it work. <laughs> I like it. Thought it was Who is that from? Elon Musk. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, I just wanted to to start with that. What with the whole, you know, reports coming out that uh, if we don't fix ourselves in the next ten years, um, humanity's fucked. Oh, well, we're not fucked. We just are going to get really wet. <laughs> really wet. <laughs> anyway. Um... Transitioning away from the that joyful note, yeah. Um, on to our next joyful note. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, with we're going to start off as we try to always do with space news, and we're going to start off with SpaceX. Uh, as the, we almost always do. Let's let's be honest. Well, yeah. Well, there's a reason they make most of the news. Um, <laughs> they make but, they uh, ma they also make most of the rockets. So. Well, that's true. Um, so, uh, there's a lot to talk about. It's been a couple weeks since our uh, three weeks, I think, since, since our last show. Because I had to yeah. bail last week. Yeah, three weeks. Um, so, we had, like, you know, stuff happen. Um, did we cover DM1 at all? I don't. No, we so. didn't because, no, we didn't because that would have been, yeah, okay. We would have been uh, covering so it in DM1 the future. Happened. Um, DM1 was demo mission one for Crew Dragon. Um, obviously, I'd like to go over it in more detail, but we don't really have time tonight because that could take a whole show all by itself. Yes. Um, 
I'll just say that demo mission one for Crew Dragon, which is uh, which was the uncrewed mission, basically to show that it worked, um, was a complete success. Everything I've heard from everywhere I've heard is that everything went pretty much as perfectly as you could expect for a demo mission, um, which is really good news. Uh, probably means that there's a good chance that uh, Crew will launch this year aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon. That flight has been is now aiming for August, I believe. <laughs> um, so they do have some leeway there. Obviously, there's a lot of things they got to check off before they can fly people, um, even after this mission. One of those is the in-flight abort test that they have to do, um, where they just prove that the abort system works. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. SpaceX doesn't have to do that. They did that voluntarily, or they signed up to do that voluntarily um, and said to NASA that they would do the abort test to show that their abort system worked. Um, and uh, so that's I mean, a good thing. Up. You want to, you do kind of want to know that that system works. It's, it's fairly important in the life scheme of things. Yeah, it's one of those things you, you never want to ever have to use it, ever. But, um, you know, it's really nice if it works when you do have to use it. <laughs> uh, I should relax? Okay, I'll relax. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, it, it was an incredibly <laughs> impressive uh, launch and mission and everything to watch. And it's DM1 is one of the last steps before bringing manned space flight back to not Russian soil, which is something <laughs> that everyone should be happy about. Um, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I just want to touch on DM1 briefly. Um, oh, man. So much has happened in the last three weeks. I'm going to not even come close to touching all of it. But uh, a few other things I should touch on are, um, well, one other thing I'm going to mention right now because it just came up in my brain is that we also uh, have now seen Starlink 1 show up on the SpaceX's manifest. The first Starlink launch is now currently scheduled for May. And... Uh, that will probably initiate a long, fairly rapid sequence of launches. Um, SpaceX did indicate they may break their launch record from last year, um, and not because of not because they actually have fewer customers this year, but they actually might break their launch record just because they're launching for themselves. Um, so for the uninitiated, Starlink is the the global internet constellation that they would like to do. And so they're going to start deploying that in May. I, I have to say it is really nice <laughs> that they've gotten these launches cheap enough that they can reasonably launch essentially without a customer. Like they don't need mm -hmm. to have someone paying them. They can put that... Because Starlink even won't won't really make money until it exists. A couple of years, yeah, right? a couple of years from now, yeah. So it's nice that they've got launching the rockets cheap enough that they can do it enough to build Starlink without the capital. Yeah, the like crazy the, the, capital. A little the crazy fast. capital that a rocket launch normally costs. Yeah. It's actually one of the reasons why SpaceX has such a big advantage in that there's, there's several different companies that are going to try and do it, but SpaceX has their own launch service. Yeah. One of the biggest costs for those companies is going to be buying hundreds of launches. So, you know, it's not cheap. <laughs> and I mean, I can imagine one of those companies going to SpaceX and be like, hey, can we launch our com competition, like our competing satellite internet on all of your rockets? And they'd be like. 
Well, they'll either say no or they'll say yes, and then they make money off of their competitors launching their yeah, satellites. It's great. So it's it's a win win on either side. <laughs> um. Anyway, is Starlink along, uh, along so that to uh, go ahead? Is Starlink a uh, low Earth orbit or is it a higher yes. orbit? No, it's low Earth orbit. It's actually going to be really low for this initial launch. These initial um. Okay. Uh, SpaceX um, actually asked for a change to their license. Um, the first 1,500 satellites are going to be at only 500 kilometers altitude, which is just above the ISS. Um, that actually means that their speed will be super fast. Um, they were originally going to do it at like 1,200 kilometers. Um, so latency will be really low, which is good. Um yeah, so just like 100 kilometers above ISS orbit is where the first 1,500 are going. Um, so moving along to our first picture of the day. Star Hopper. We're at a picture already? We were at a picture already. I added them like at the last second. Oh, that's why. Yeah. One moment, please. I'll give you two moments. Uh... Haha! I can do things. Look at that. Ooh. That is Starhopper. The reason I put up this picture of Starhopper. Um, so we got like Elon did his thing where he just like goes on Twitter and he's like, here's all the information you want. Like once every once a month or so. Um so we learned lots of stuff. Uh, that is the that is Star Hopper. It's going to be the suborbital uh, test vehicle for the eventual Starship, um, which is of course a vehicle, fully reusable vehicle that they plan to use for all sorts of things, but including manned missions to the Moon and Mars. Now, this little guy is uh, about sixty feet tall, including the legs. And this is as tall as this one's going to get. You remember, it had uh, there were lots of pictures of it with a nose cone before. They had a really serious storm um, down there, and the nose cone happened to be detached from the vehicle at the time, and it blew over in the wind and was destroyed. Um, after initially suggesting that they would rebuild a new nose cone, um, they uh, Elon came out and said that uh, they decided not to do it because they actually don't need it. They're only flying, you know, in atmosphere. Um, to fairly low altitudes, so they're not going to bother. Um, however, that definitely posed a weird question for those of us in the SpaceX community because we had seen them building what we thought was a nose cone over at the construction site. So can you move on to my other two pictures there? I can. So what we learned was... This excited more than a few people. The things that we thought were going to be an, uh, another nose cone are actually the beginnings of the hull of the orbital prototype for Starship. So, yeah, they're moving at SpaceX speed. <laughs> um... So, yeah, this picture and the other picture are two sections of the hull for the eventual uh, prototype for the orbital uh, Starship prototype, um, which will be pretty damn cool. Uh, I, most people expect that it will probably launch first as like a high altitude hopper, so like into fairly high up in the atmosphere. Um, and then when the super heavy prototype, which is the booster... Uh, is done, then they'll launch it to orbit. And all of that is pretty cool. Now, what else did we learn? Lots of stuff, but a um, few other things I'm going to talk about. We learned that um, for Starship, um, 
they will have a launch site in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and one in Boca Chica, Texas, which is where all of this stuff is happening right now. Um, they will also have a manufacturing facility at both places, and they will make they will make basically two vehicles at a time, one at each place. Um, they'll make the booster and the and the uh, the starship, the actual like spaceship, in the same place. So they don't have to transport it at all. Um, also noted, because we one of the kind of interesting things that Elon had said a while ago was that they were going to try and use transpiration cooling, which is really cool, but hadn't really ever been done before um, <laughs> on a spacecraft like this. Basically, what that mean what that meant was that, without going into it too much, the as it reentered the atmosphere, the uh, ship would sweat liquid fuel, and that would keep it cool, um, or at least cool enough not to burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the current thinking is now that. Um, SpaceX is going to use um, hexagonal heat shield tiles that they are developing um, across most of the vehicle, but some of the hottest spots, they will use transpiration cooling, which is what I mentioned before. Um, I uh, know, actually, because the liquid, I mean, yes, the liquid fuel will burn, but it's already extremely hot outside anyway. It's not really going to do anything. Um, the The bonus is that the liquid fuel is extremely cold. Um, so it will, uh, and it also will create like a vapor barrier over the surface of the skin. Um, actually, it's pretty neat. It's, so it's the same way that your body, your body um, uh, cools with sweat, but they're using fuel. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, so what it sounds like is the, at first they're going to cover the vehicle, probably cover the whole vehicle uh, on, on the side that needs to enter the atmosphere in hexagonal tiles, heat shield tiles. Then they'll do some reentry testing and then see where those tiles are wearing away. And they will remove the tiles for future vehicles in those spots and use transpiration cooling in those, in those spots. Pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that more or less covers Starhopper, except for saying that there is now a single Raptor, Raptor engine installed on Starhopper, as you could see in the picture before. Um, and it is ready to begin hopping. Um, they have the highway closed tomorrow, and it is apparently planned to hop tomorrow for the first time ever. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Do we get to watch that? Uh, probably, but probably not in an official capacity. There are many webcams pointed at this thing <laughs> and many, many photographers who will be standing just outside the exclusion zone. Right. But, uh, and I'm sure they would, they'll probably post a video on their YouTube, but they tend not to live stream things like that. Mostly because they have like a six hour window and a lot of times they end up using like a lot of it. So it's very, there's no like set time they're going to do yeah. it. As long as yeah. they get some official footage and show it to us, oh, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be a lot like the old Grasshopper videos from yeah. way back when. And they always showed those videos. Um, so I uh, want to move on to Falcon Heavy. Yes. Everyone remember Falcon Heavy? I know it's been a little while. <laughs> um, but you're going to get lots of Falcon Heavy coming up here pretty soon. Um, April 7th, Falcon Heavy is launching again, launching its first commercial mission for Arabsat. They're launching the Arabsat 6A satellite to geostationary transfer orbit aboard Falcon Heavy. Um, Falcon Heavy will uh, have the two side cores come back to land at Cape Canaveral, and the center core will be caught 960 kilometers downrange by the drone ship. This is the by far the longest catch ever by the drone ship. That's, that's a 50% longer. That's a far ways away. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, to 
what we know about this launch so far, April 7th is the intended launch date. Um, Pad 39A has been converted to be used as a, for Falcon Heavy, and all three cores are at Cape, at the Cape, and um, were at, they were actually seen uh, during the work for DM1. So everything's ready to go. Uh, about I guess that's about three weeks from now. Yeah, a little under three weeks from now. That's and I will because we've only seen the Falcon Heavy launch like once, once, right? The demo mission, yeah. Yeah, so seeing an actual commercial launch of it will be um, fantastic. Just fantastic. Because it was one of the best launches to watch. Oh, I know. It was, like, crazy. I can't wait for this one. Um, I will definitely be um, streaming this launch. Unless I'm at work, but I'm going to try not to be at work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um Yes, sir. The the two boosters landing at the same time was one of the greatest things I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. Period. Like, And let's hope they can catch the center core this time. Yeah. <laughs> so really cool news about this is that they're going to do this mission. The two side, two side boosters are going to land. The center core is going to land. The two side boosters are immediately going to go for refurbishment. They will be refurbished as fast as possible, and then they will fly again right away with a new center core for the STP-2 mission in May or June. Probably June. But only... So it was like a year and a bit between the first and second Falcon Heavy launch. It's only going to be two months between the second, second and third, third Falcon Heavy launch. Nice. Um, so it'd be at least two this year. There'll probably be two next year. So we'll get to see it more often. Yeah, um, so I w wanted to mention that. Also, Light Sail 2 is on the STP2 launch in June. That's good. For Planet Light Sail is cool. Yep. So I also had to mention, can you put up the picture from Benu? Something really uh, weird happened in planetary science today. Oh, is this today? Yep. Well, it didn't happen today, but they talked about it today. They showed us today for the first time. So Osiris Rex is a NASA spacecraft that's, uh, that's the wrong picture. <laughs> there we go. You gotta give me a second to do the switch. I know, I know, I know. I do the switchy. Um, so Osiris Rex is a NASA spacecraft at an asteroid called Bennu, and it is going to be doing a sample return mission from the asteroid, which means it's going to land and grab a sample and then scurry off home like a chipmunk. Um, so they had... They're, they're very confused. I mean, confused doesn't even touch it. They don't know what's going on. Um, they have observed now 11 events of rocks just, like, shooting off the surface of the asteroid. What? Um, and it's a little asteroid. It's not very big. So it can't have, like, a core that is, like, volcanoing things out. Like, not, so not it getting hit. No. It's spewing stuff off its surface. And as you can see in the picture, if you look at the picture where the red arrow is, there's a whole bunch of rocks being thrown off the surface. I actually got a picture of it. Um, it's They've seen it 11 times. And um, they don't know why. They're, they're totally, like, okay. Um, Clearly, uh, it's actually... The asteroid is actually containing Thulu, uh, and that is it cracking its uh, shell to come and devour Earth. Yeah, obviously. I, obviously. obviously. I'm pretty sure that's the only logical response here. The only... Pro I mean, this is really cool, and scientists love stuff they don't understand because then they have to try and figure out what's going on. Um, and... Um, but it does pose a little bit of a problem in that the spacecraft spacecraft has to get really close to the asteroid <laughs> <laughs> to get the sample. So they're moderately concerned <laughs> that no, uh, they might get hit. It's by the something. asteroid's planetary defense system. Apparently, it has built-in flak <laughs> cannons. But yeah, so that was really cool. And now they now there's one more thing we don't understand about asteroids. 
is yeah normally this would happen because of like outgassing or because of you know in some other worlds it happens because there's like geysers and stuff but that requires there to be some core activity and this thing's little it's way too small to have any kind of core and so they're just kind of like this is really weird <laughs> Um, so in your favorite topic, we're going to switch over to SLS news. Uh, SLS is dead. Long live <laughs> SLS. Kind of. Um, so things are starting to move on the SLS front. Um, the White House budget request came. Okay, so the way NASA budgets work is the White House makes a request and then Congress either goes no and does whatever they feel like or they take bits and pieces of it and they decide to build it into the budget. Anyway, the White House's budget request for NASA um, sucked. Fun- no, not completely. It wasn't amazing, but it wasn't terrible. What it did was it cut funding for all future versions of SLS beyond the first one um, in order to try and divert more funding into getting it off the ground. <laughs> um, then Jim Bridenstine, who's the administrator of NASA, and as I've come to know, pretty cool person. He, he seems legit. Um, but uh, he... He said a few days later at a hearing that um, there's basically no way that they can get FLS off, um, to launch by its current projected date, which is uh, June of 2020. Um, and then I heard rumors floating around that the delay would be till November of 2021, which is 17 months. Um, <laughs> anyway... Um, SLS is dead. Then with SLS. And the suggestion by him was that they were going NASA was going to examine launching Orion, the EM1 mission on Orion, on a commercial rocket, which is like <laughs> like blew up the space community for like a week until he went, Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> it's gonna end up happening. I think it may because I think they just I don't know. Oh my goodness. Oh uh, what? Oh holy hey Captain Richard. Hello. How's it going? Uh That's a lot of people. Hi people. That's a lot of Captain Richard. That's a lot of Captain Richard. Uh, yeah, we're going to get wrecked. Uh, actually, you, you all are going to get wrecked because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, long stream ahead of us. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're talking about... Um, space. Space and the Apollo program today. So, welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, Captain Richard. Thank Thanks you. for the raid, Captain Richard. <laughs> all right. So, back to the, back to the matter at hand. Um, so, uh, basically what he said was after he threatened to put EM-1 on commercial rockets, the SLS guys came back and said, wait, no, we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. (laughs) Please don't get rid of the only reason for our damn rocket to exist. So, we'll see how it turns out. NASA is currently working on studying how a commercial um, uh, EM-1 could work. Um, the thought is that it would be two heavy rocket launches, um, either a Delta IV heavy and a Falcon heavy, maybe two Falcon heavies, maybe two Delta IV heavies. Um, but two Delta IV heavies is fairly unlikely as it would cost almost as much as SLS. Anyway, um, the other news for for SLS was that Jason Davis of the Planetary Society discovered that they did something super sketchy. Which is not a huge surprise. Uh, Jason Davis was digging through the SLS's payload numbers, which um, had been updated last year by um, NASA. 
And they had said, oh, through all these magic ways, we managed to increase the payload mass for SLS Block 1 from 70 tons to 95 tons to orbit. And everyone went, well, that's okay. Well, all right, sure, I guess, if that's what you say it can do. Um, and then Jason Davis of the Planetary Society did some more reading on it. And he found out that they are including the upper stage of the rocket as payload. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's how they managed to increase it from 70 tons to 95 tons. They just increased, they just included the upper stage as payload instead of as rocket. That's, that's not how <laughs> anything works. Uh, no. So that was an interesting SLS moment as well. <laughs> anyway... Um, British because this is the only one I happen to have on my desk at the time. Sorry, it's all you get, Mr. Hasgaha, and I also can't tie it right now. <laughs> I'm failing right. badly. So, that's my very abbreviated Space News. I could go on for like another two hours on Space News alone, but we're going to jump into Apollo. Yeah, Darge is right. That's, that's like, I, I weigh... 120 pounds as long as you don't count all of me yeah <laughs> it's like Screw you know it. i weigh i weigh 100 pounds if you only count my legs you know? yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um that that's that's not just sketchy math that's like <laughs> that's a straight up lie because you're like, oh, yeah, our payload can hold this. And someone comes along being like, we've got this payload. Can you do it? And they're like, actually. No. No. <laughs> oh, wh why not? Because that's, that's not our payload. <laughs> why? And obviously, the reason for this was very much a, a matter of, um, of like public perception. Because SLS Block 1 has a payload capacity of 70 tons. Falcon Heavy's payload capacity is 64 tons. Falcon Heavy costs less than 15% of what <laughs> SLS costs. SLS And is that's if you're being nice useless. to SLS. It's anyway. useless. Anyway, yes. So, is it Apollo time? Uh, yeah, Apollo 14. We're 40 minutes in. Time to start. No, we're not. We're only like 30 minutes in because we started late. Right, fine, 30 minutes in. You gotta, you gotta, gotta yeah, I tried to keep it. We're, we're 30 minutes in as long as you don't count when we started. In fact, we're late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're Let's up first. It. Image. Right, I had that. And then. Pignia, Apollo 14. And then like four more images after that. <laughs> Wait, no, hang on. Wrong logo. I'm Again. at the top. I'm at the top. You are. I gotta go all the way to the bottom. All Here we go. Up. You gotta go to Apollo 14. There you go. Yeah. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, this oh. one's a terrible logo, too. It's horrible. This. <laughs> <laughs> it's very 70s. Very, very 70s. That's a. That's a really. Bad logo. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, not only is that, like, is that a yellow or is it, like, trying to be gold and failing horribly? Yes. Wow. Uh, Just yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. Apollo 14. So, Apollo 14. Apollo 14 was the eighth manned mission in the Apollo program and the fourth that was intended to land on the moon. Um, obviously, the third that was intended to land on the moon became Apollo 13, and we all know how that went. Wait, how'd that one go? Um, the rocket decided to blow a big hole in its side. Right, yes. And they had to limp all the way home. <laughs> and decided, we should probably go home rather than... Uh, trying to land on the moon with a crippled moon. rocket? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a good call. Yeah. Um, so, for Apollo 14, the crew was Command Module Pilot Stuart Rosa, Commander Alan Shepard, 
and Lunar Module pilot Edgar Mitchell, which you can see in this crew picture. Bam, there it is. And uh, Apollo 14 began on January 31st, 1971, with the liftoff of the Saturn V rocket from Kennedy Space Center. They lifted off 40 minutes late because of a weather delay. It's actually the first weather delay in the Apollo program, which is, like, kind of crazy. Um, due to the low clouds, the rocket actually, like, sort of left the pad and then disappeared into the clouds right away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thankfully, they had some like off-site viewing angles, so they were able to see the rocket all the way up. Upon reaching orbit, Apollo 14's command module, Kitty Hawk, had some difficulty docking with the lunar module and Terry's. They, they ended up trying for almost two hours before um, mission control suggested that they hold Kitty Hawk against and Terry's using the thrusters and then retract the docking probe. Uh, just to see if the docking latches would grab. And it worked. <laughs> Which is good, because it was the sixth attempt to dock, dock the two together. Things would have gone very poorly if they couldn't get the litter module. Yeah. Um, after their uneventful trip to lunar orbit, after that, um, Edgar Mitchell and Alan Shepard crawled aboard the Antares, which was the name of the lunar module, and began their descent to Fra Mora. Fra Mora was the intended landing site of the aborted Apollo 13 mission. And here you can see the lunar module on its way to the surface. Pretty cool shot. It's all upside down and stuff. So, after separating from Kitty Hawk, Antares experienced two serious problems. <laughs> Pretty much right away. Good start. The first, the first was that the lunar module computer began getting an abort signal from a faulty switch. NASA believed that, that a tiny ball of solder may have come loose and closed the circuit for the switch. Percussive maintenance, which basically result, <laughs> uh, was tapping on the panel beside the switch, briefly worked, but then it basically just happened again. It, it, is that an official NASA term, by the way? I have no idea, but it's definitely a term I use. I, I really, really <laughs> like the term percussive maintenance. Yes, my computer is not working. Excuse me for a moment. I must perform some percussive maintenance. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so they tried that, but it didn't really, it worked only briefly, and then the abort code returned. So they had this big problem because if they actually lit up the descent engine while this abort code was being received, the the module would actually just immediately dump the descent stage and abort back into orbit. <laughs> so there would be like no way to land. Um, what are you laughing about? I just, I love the problems that... Oh, I know. The, the, the weird problems that NASA managed to experience along the way. Um... So NASA and the software team scrambled to try and figure out what to do. And basically they settled on, well, we have to reprogram the lander. <laughs> um, and so with like no time at all, they figured out a way to reprogram the lander to ignore the abort code. And um, then they had to basically, tra basically they transmitted these software modifications by telling um, Edgar Mitchell uh, what to enter into the computer. <laughs> over the headset and he end ended up having to enter 80 keystrokes into the keyboard um, in the right order to fix this problem basically that's fantastic um, yeah it sure is so this resolved the issue just barely in time <laughs> and if they had failed to resolve the problem of course they would not have been able to land um, the second issue was that after they, they experienced this right after that one <laughs> was that the landing radar failed to lock onto the moon's surface, which means they didn't know what their altitude was and they didn't know how fast they were descending. Um, so again, just in time, they cycled the breaker on the radar and finally it acquired a signal when they were at 18,000 feet in altitude. 
Um, and then because they didn't really trust the radar, they uh, Alan Shepard manually landed all the way from like 18,000 feet all the way down. Um, and he actually ended up landing closer to his intended target than any of the previous missions, despite being purely manual. <clears throat> Edgar Mitchell believes that Alan Shepard would have attempted the landing even without the radar. So believes that they would have had to abort. <laughs> so, after they successfully landed on the moon, uh, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell began their excursion onto the lunar surface. Shepard's first words on the moon were, and it's been a long way. But we're here. I mean, it's not quite as grandiose as one small step, but uh, it's not bad. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, pictures. Oh, actually, video now. Shepard and Mitchell on the moon. There we go. This one has no audio, but it does show them coming down the... Uh, the ladder. Well, one of them anyway. <laughs> and setting up the flag. So it looks like a really complicated operation when you're in that kind of like suit. You're just like super awkward. It, it does look quite a bit sped up. I don't know how much, but... Yeah, it's, it's way sped up. This is just so that, you know, um, and this is one of the videos that was one of the official videos that was just uh, sped up to show more stuff. Taking a picture and there. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, a couple pictures after this. One is the plaque. This is uh, the plaque that they, that this mission left on the moon. Um, obviously not taken on the surface of the moon, but uh, that was the plaque. It's actually weird. Apollo 14 and 15, their plaques, the pictures of their plaques weren't taken on the moon. They were taken like in lab and stuff. Um, anyway, and I just thought that was an awesome, awesome still shot of uh, Shepard with the flag. You'll notice that she Alan Shepard here has red stripes on his arms, legs, um, and helmet. Um, this was actually because during Apollo 12, they couldn't tell the astronauts apart when they're on the surface. <laughs> they looked exactly the same. So they decided to add red stripes to the commander's spacesuit for Apollo 13, but obviously they never landed anywhere. Um, and uh, but they continued on with this. Actually, this that tradition continued all the way to current day. That still happens now. The commander get and gets the red stripes in their suit, so you can tell them apart. Hmm. Do and yeah. does what's up? That include, uh, just, that, like that's that's still being used on the ISS. Uh, so only the commander gets the colors, though, right? So you can tell yeah. the commander, but the commander can't tell the other two from each other because they have no. Well, idea. there's only there's only two people on the surface. True. So, yeah. Good point. Fine. I mean, Details. If they had, I'm sure if they had like four or five people, they would just have different colors for everyone. Um. So, um. Do, 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 do. During their stay on the surface, Mitchell and Shepard took two spacewalks. They added new seismic studies to the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, known as ULSEP. You'll actually notice this is on every Apollo mission. It's just like a set, or not even necessarily set, but a group of experiments that they, that they package together and lay out on the surface on every mission. Um, during this mission, they used a modular equipment transporter gotta love nasa's names which is a pull cart for carrying equipment and supplies <laughs> and the crew named it the lunar rickshaw and you can see the picture of it there <laughs> <laughs> that's again <laughs> it's a cart yeah i know okay they love names <laughs> During the second EVA, 
the pair of astronauts attempted to reach the rim of the 300 meter wide cone crater. Unfortunately, due to the terrain, they were unable to locate the rim of the crater, though it was later revealed they actually came with only within only 30 meters of finding it. They had to call off the effort as both Mitchell and Shepard became physically exhausted and low on oxygen. Before departing, the pair deployed and activated several instruments and experiments and collected 45 kilograms of lunar, supply, uh, lunar samples. And on a less serious note, Alan Shepard brought along a six iron golf club head, which he could attach to the handle of a lunar excavation tool fashioning a golf club. And he also smuggled along two golf balls. And now we can watch the golf video. Do you have the audio going? Good. Wait. Do you have the audio going? No, you do not. Wait. I'm supposed to. Find the audio button. <laughs> Oh, maybe it's this. Okay. This is the famous, Here. Um, you know, like Apollo golf golf swing. There you go. You may have to turn up your volume a little bit. That's so fun. I like the last one here. Watch this one. This one's funny. Miles and miles and miles. Very good, <laughs> And to uh, answer Ed's question earlier, the Kilo was used for the window shot bed, so you ought to bring it back. <laughs> So that was um, that was golf with Alan Shepard. I like that one. Yeah, that one is good. Um, also, there was no video of it, but also um, Edgar Mitchell threw a lunar scoop handle like a javelin, and you can actually there's a picture here we're going to show <laughs> of the javelin <laughs> laying in a crater with a golf ball like just this side of it. It's really hard to see, but it's like a couple feet closer. Because um, why not? Exactly. <laughs> After this momentous occasion, the crew then ascended from the moon to orbit and successfully reunited with Stuart Rosa aboard Kitty Hawk in lunar orbit. A, we have a couple of great views of the command module here. I actually really like these pictures. <clears throat> Yeah, pretty cool. So Stuart Rosa, I actually really like this story. This is really cool. Stuart Rosa, who had worked in forestry in his youth, brought along several hundred tree seeds on the flight. They were germinated upon returning to Earth and were widely distributed around the United States and several other countries. And they are known as moon trees. And they remain alive, or most of them remain alive to this day. Um, and, I mean... That was this. This mission is fairly short in terms of our coverage of it. Um, that's just sort of it wasn't as much. Apollo f Apollo fifteen is a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Apollo fourteen crew returned to Earth as a, without incident, and they were plucked out of the ocean by the USS New Orleans on February 9th, nineteen seventy one. Yay! Splashdown! Woohoo! Yep. And now we're on to Apollo 15. And let's start with the insignia, which looks significantly better. Oh, look at that. It doesn't look hideous. 
I like this one a lot more. Yeah. It's not like amazing, but it's way better. It it's not amazing, <laughs> no, but it's also not diarrhea force fed <laughs> through your eye holes like the previous one is. Oh wow. Um so let's move on to the crew picture here. You may think Apollo I'm being fi- harsh. <laughs> I'm not. Apollo 15 was the ninth manned mission of the Apollo program, and it would include a much longer stay on the moon with a greater focus on science and exploration. It will also science. include it would also include the first lunar roving vehicle, which I will now refer to as the LRV. So, interestingly, Apollo 15 wasn't always intended to be a longer duration exploration mission. It became one because of budget cuts to Apollo that forced the cancellation of three Apollo missions. The crew of Apollo, this actually ended up, so they, they changed what the mission was, and then they had to redesign the service module the command module they had to add a they had to add a rover they had to redesign the lunar module and then they had to redesign the rocket and they had to retrain all the crew easy (laughs) um for this mission that's nothing for this mission the crew actually got extended training in geology by a by a professional geologist um for month actually like two years prior to the mission i think it was um and uh and so they actually were the first like real scientists basically they weren't geologists but they were shown what to do what to look for how to communicate with the scientists on earth when they were when they were talking about the samples they were collecting all this so For this particular mission, the lunar module was Falcon, which I quite enjoy, and the command module was named Endeavor. And we have a great video of the launch with audio. Now 25 seconds. We have complete clearance to launch. We are go. 20. 15 seconds, guidance internal, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, all engines running, launch commit, Watch this guy go. Um, Falcos 01. Um, I I actually haven't read or seen anything about it yet. I know that it, it's out there. Um, I would recommend just because he knows his stuff. I would recommend going to check out Scott Manley's video on the asteroid that hit us and nobody noticed because um, <laughs> it's in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> um, apparently it was a fairly significant blast. Uh, oh like yeah, something like. 170 megatons of force. Um, but uh, it was out in the middle of the ocean, so nobody really noticed, except the fish, I guess. That's um, <laughs> that's actually frightening as hell. Because, <laughs> right? like, that hits somewhere else, that's a city gun. Yeah. Right? Pretty much. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened with Chelyabinsk, right? I mean, it wasn't flattened, but um, yeah. all it had was that asteroid exploded, like, many kilometers above it, and it yeah. broke every window in that city. <laughs> and knocked some buildings down. Like, okay. Asteroids are scary shit, guys. <laughs> yep. As Neil deGrasse Tyson says, asteroids are... Uh, 
are the universe's way of asking you, how's your space program going? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, back to Apollo 15. So, Apollo 15 launched aboard Saturn V, as you just saw, on July 26th of 1971. One minor issue that was present shortly after the launch was that uh, there was a malfunctioning light on the spacecraft service and propul service propulsion system. After a lot of troubleshooting, they attempted a test burn to using that system, and it was successful. So the service propul propulsion system is actually like the service module below the command module. That's its engine. It's, a, it's actually the main propulsion for the mission after the rocket is gone. Um, and after, but the, their biggest fear was that because this light was on, that that engine might just unexpectedly fire. Um, so for the most part, the astronauts um, turned that control bank off when they, when they weren't using it, and they only turned it on for major burns. And when they did burn the engine, they controlled it manually um, because they didn't trust it. Um, it was discovered after the mission that there was a tiny bit of wire trapped in the switch. Where have we seen this before? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Other issues that they ran into before arriving at the moon included a broken tape meter cover. This, is ba this instrument is basically how they uh, keep track of... Um, their distance when they are uh, trying to land in the in the lunar module. Um, so the the cover for this instrument was broken, and there was shards of glass all over the in, inside of the uh, lunar module. So the astronauts had to chase around these shards of glass. <laughs> the back of and then they found a wait water wait, wait wait hey, hold on. They just have a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I mean, why are you questioning it? I'm just... I, I'm surprised that it calls it a, a vacuum cleaner and not a, um, you know, autonomous <laughs> air intake robot or something. Fair enough. Um, so after they, cha they chased these shards of glass around, they found there was a water leak. And then they had to chase blobs of water around with towels and clean them up as well. Sargrath's got it. An orbital Thankfully, suction sanitation device. There you go. Perfect. Um, both of these problems could have been serious problems, but neither of them actually ended up being serious. Um, thankfully. After the orbital insertion burn and the resumption of communications with Earth, David Scott's immediate comment about the, was about the beauty of the moon. Leading Alan Shepard, who was on the ground at Mission Control awaiting a TV interview, co to comment, to hell with that shit, just give us the details of the burn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Once in orbit around the moon, the orbit was modified to allow for an easy descent of the lunar module with as much fuel conserved as possible. This was because the lunar module was now much heavier and been uh, modified to include a lunar rover and to include um, far more supplies um, because they were staying on the moon for much longer um, and also n more batteries and solar panels. As the crew prepared the lunar module for its descent, they also continued observations of the moon and provided television of the surface of the moon from orbit. I I, David... I want to cut in here just for a second because I know some of the people watching have been saying that they remember watching uh, watching these live at the time on TV. Oh, man. And... I wish I was you. Yeah. <laughs> people. I, I would love to see these live. These still get me now, mm -hmm. and I I cannot wait to watch with you know a couple minutes delay people landing on Mars. I ju mm -hmm. <laughs> fuck just 
and you know the one thing that's going to be amazing when we go back to the moon and when we go to Mars is it won't be in 240p anymore either yeah um one of the <clears throat> it actually should be noted one of the, it was in the nasa budget was money for co- um <clears throat> basically allowing nasa to buy commercial um deep space communications um reception basically currently all of that is done through what's called the dsn or the deep space network um which is owned by nasa but there is money in the budget for them to start developing a commercial side to that so that they can have way more capacity so we'll see and i part i think part of that is that spacex is going to have to build their own dsn anyway if they want to do these crazy missions so yeah Anyway, after David Scott and James Irwin entered the lunar module and fully prepared for the descent, the undocking was planned at ju- for just over 100 hours into the mission. But when the separation was attempted, nothing happened at all. <laughs> so, after some quick troubleshooting that involved, well, plugging in the loose probe instrumentation umbilical back in the (laughs) lunar module departed 25 minutes late and go yeah (laughs) how's it going down there Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, so during during descent the crew was initially in a position such that they were laying down facing away from the moon so they couldn't see the surface After a pitch over maneuver, they were upright and could see the surface in front of them. However, they immediately saw a problem. Um, David Scott realized he didn't know any of the surface features he was seeing, and he had trained many times in simulations for what the surface would look like as he came in to land. This was because, um, probably because of the late departure, they were about a kilometer off course meant that their landing path was a kilometer like off to the side. So he didn't really recognize a lot of the um, a lot of the craters and stuff that he was seeing. So but he prepared to land anyway, just assuming that he was going to land way off course. But as they came in closer and closer, he actually was able to see their landing target, which was a place called Hadley Rill. Um, a rill is like, um, kind of looks like a river, but it's on the, on the moon. So it was never a river. It just looks like this, like squiggly line in the surface. It's also a really pretty word. Yeah, it is. Eventually he did catch sight of the, of Hadley rill and they were able to move back towards it. They didn't quite get there, but they got closer. (laughs) Um, once he was below 60 feet. Scott couldn't see the surface because of the amount of dust being kicked up. This lunar module had a larger engine bell than previous legs, and it was imperative that Scott shut down the engine as soon as the probes on the legs indicated contact. He did so, but this led to a somewhat hard landing. His crewmate Irwin exclaimed, BAM! as they touched down. Due to the limited visibility upon landing, the lunar module in a crater and this caused a 6.9 degree tilt back and an 8.6 degree tilt to the left which you can definitely see in the pictures later um thankfully the module did not continue tilting as they would have basically had to abort immediately back to orbit um but all was well falcon landed on the moon on july 30th 1971 I, I do actually want to make one <clears throat> one quick comment because Driz Jordan in chat is saying it's pretty pretty amazing memorizing crater formations and patterns to pick your landing location, which it is. Yep. And until we did this, like today's, I had no idea one that they did it that way, and two that it was based on, like they, they planned things down so that when they launched and got out there they this would land, like 
they'd know exactly what they were seeing based on the time that they went, which is mm -hmm. nuts amount of planning when you think about it. Like, <laughs> yes, it sure is. Like, where are we? Where are we going to? At what time are we going to launch so you get there so that you see it? And also, we have to train you based on where. Just, it's quite impressive. Is is all? Yeah. This was seat of your pants um, flying. <laughs> yeah, and it was amazing. Um, so we have a great uh, video here. It's actually a couple minutes long, but it's worth seeing. It's of the. Uh, the landing of Apollo 15, seen out the window of the spacecraft. Coming right. Four zero. Five thousand feet. Three nine. Three nine. Three eight. Three nine. Four thousand feet. Four zero, four one, four five, oops, four seven, five two, three thousand feet, five two, five two, five one, five zero, four seven, four seven, two thousand feet, four two, okay, got a good spot. Good. Four two, four three, three hundred feet. Falcon Houston, you go for landing. Four five, budge go for landing. Four four, four five, thousand feet. Four five, nine hundred. Four five, eight hundred. Four five, seven hundred. Four six. Six hundred four eight. Five hundred four nine. Minus seventeen. I'm not sure. I was trying 15, to figure out what the numbers they're calling are. I don't know there. Minus fourteen. Yep, P sixty six. Okay. Three hundred feet. Minus eleven. Minus eleven. Two hundred fifty. Minus eleven. Nine percent fuel. 200 minus 11, 150 minus 7, minus 6, 120 feet, minus 6. Okay, I've got some rest. Minus 5, 100 feet at 5. 9% fuel, minus 5, 80 at 5, minus 3, minus 5, 60 at 3, minus 50 at 3. Cross pointers look good. Here you can see it's 60 feet. They couldn't see much. 33. 25. 2. 7% fuel. 20 at 1. 15 at 1. Minus 1. Minus 1. 6% fuel. 10 feet minus 1. Eight feet minus one. Contact. Man. Okay, you student the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Roger, Roger, Falcon. It's so fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like just so Damn. fantastic. And uh Knight Rider, um not only is it nuts that it all had to be perfect the first like you only get one shot what to me as we've been going through and we're on Apollo 15 we've gone through quite a number of them at this point now the thing that keeps coming up that that keeps amazing me is so many things go wrong that have never gone wrong before and you've got a bunch of people's lives on the line and they're in space and it's it's not just the astronauts who are nuts quite frankly but they have such a 
like competent support team back on the ground as well. The whole, just all of it is. Yeah. One of the things I noticed with a lot of these problems is they call down and they go, this really weird thing is happening. And the guys on the ground go, okay, we'll fix it yep. from here. <laughs> or we'll figure out how to fix it from here. <laughs> it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. So due to the time of the landing, the crew couldn't immediately EVA onto the lunar surface as they needed to sleep. But we did have a short... <laughs> well, that was the commander's decision was that they keep the same um, like daily cycle. Right. Um, but they did have a short time, about a half an hour before they had to go to sleep. And so David Scott was able to convince Mission Control to allow him a brief through the top hatch of the lunar, lunar module. Basically him just standing up outside the lunar top hatch of the lunar module, <laughs> looking around. Um, he wanted to do this to survey their surroundings, make plans for the operations the following day, and, and also take pictures. This was the only standing EVA through the top hatch of the lunar module that was ever done. Anyway, after closing the hatch once again and repressurizing Falcon, moved their spacesuits to go to sleep. This They became the first astronauts to ever remove their spacesuits on the lunar surface. Which, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Um, while the crew were sleeping, Mission Control observed a slow but steady loss of <laughs> oxygen inside the Falcon. The crew were eventually awakened an hour early, and the source of the problem was found to be an open valve on the urine <laughs> transfer device. Urine Oops. transfer device. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a good one. Uh, Just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> this was quickly resolved, and the crew began preparations for their first full EVA. And now we have this cool video that I quite enjoy. This is them trying to deploy the lunar rover. Yoink. <laughs> okay, I want to do this one again so you can actually yeah, see it. Watch, it. watch this one again because it, it's it's cool to see where it's actually stashed on the side of the vehicle. And, and you can see that the wheels kind of like pop out. Boop. Right? Yep. Because they had I love to that find they were able to just like shove a vehicle into the side of their vehicle. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> And yeah, they managed to get the weight of that thing down to less than 500 pounds. So, not bad. <clears throat> so, near the beginning of the first full EVA, the crew attempted to deploy the lunar ro <clears throat> ro the LRV, the lunar roving vehicle. But they had difficulty due to the tilt of the lander. Uh, Mission Control suggested lifting the front end of the rover, as you can see in the video, as they extracted it, and this worked just fine. Um, an issue notable shortly afterwards was the front wheel steering of the rover didn't work, so they had to use the rear wheel steer. The LRV had a driving speed of up to 10 to 12 kilometers per hour. Not exactly <laughs> racing in this thing. And then there's a good video of the LRV driving. So this one is weird. I uploaded this from the, my first source, and YouTube immediately copyright striked it and removed it. Hmm. I'm like, you can't copyright a NASA video. <laughs> so I downloaded it from a different source and uploaded it, and it was fine. It's exactly the same video. No idea what's going on there. <laughs> That's a weird one. I just thought this was kind of cool. They had, they had a TV camera on the little ro the little vehicle, and uh, you could see them booting her across the uh, lunar surface there. You notice also that unlike the previous lunar landings that were all like, always on planes, this has like mountains and gullies and all sorts of things around them. Um, so, during the initial drive, the crew were able to better establish their location, which they weren't really sure of when they landed, <laughs> and the location of their intended landing spot, Hadley Rill. They collected samples along the way and returned to Falcon to drop them off. 
And then we have another great picture of the LRV, which is worth taking a look at. That's a beautiful picture. It really is. The crew then worked towards setting up the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, which we talked about in the last mission. Unfortunately, David Scott had difficulty drilling the required holes for the heat flow experiment, and that work was not finished before the end of the first EVA, which lasted 6 hours and 32 minutes. Up in orbit, around the moon, was still the Endeavour spacecraft, and uh, I need to get his name right, just a moment. Um, <laughs> Alfred Warden was uh, doing a lot of science in orbit. Um, that was his job while they were down on the moon. He had a whole big package of, uh, of uh, equipment um, that was actually stashed away in the service module um, to take uh, photos and um, various scientific measurements with. This was a great picture that he got of the site. Silkovsky, uh, Silkovsky crater on the far side of the moon. That's a large crater. Yeah. Yeah. So, back to the surface. Interestingly, starting with the crew's second EVA and continuing through the third and final one, the LRV... Correctly. What was that? You cut out there for a second. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Interestingly, starting with the crew's second EVA and continuing through the third and final one, the LRV's front wheel steering started to work correctly. Oh. Because why not, I suppose? <laughs> they were never really sure why that <laughs> happened. Um, <laughs> and here's a good picture of them looking back at Falcon. Um, it's actually up a little from where, from where you're at there, David. Um Looking back at Falcon during the second EVA, I, I just really like this shot. See that like little, almost boulder-looking thing in the plane way over there? That's their lunar huh. module. <clears throat> yeah. So they got quite a decent distance from it with, the, uh, with their LRV. During the second EVA, the crew traveled to the slope of Mount Hadley Delta, where they collected samples, and then they spent about an hour at Spur Crater, where they discovered or recovered what became known as one of the most famous lunar specimens ca called the Genesis Rock. It is believed to have been part of the early lunar crust, and a sample like this was actually the reason they chose this site to begin with. That is the Genesis Rock. Looks like a rock. Sure does. <laughs> um, and then there's a great picture again. Uh, two, a couple of great pictures here in a row. Uh, um, David Scott with the lunar <sighs> rover. Oh, that I'm sorry. I work. screwed up that picture. I tried. <clears throat> here, I'll fix that link. Just a moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Excuse our technical difficulties. Okay, link is fixed. Try it again. And the next one is also missing. Haha! Fixed. We're good. It's fixed. We're professional. No, we're not. Not at all. <laughs> um. Da, 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 da. But yeah, I, I love these pictures. The uh, lunar <laughs> rover. It's such a weird little vehicle. Um, it's it's nothing. It's a frame, yeah. wheels, and the batteries that power. Because it Basically. needs. It doesn't need anything else, right? Yep. Uh, one of the reasons I actually chose this picture to show as well is because uh, you can see some of the very terrain they had, like this big gully there and out in front of them. Um, is very different from the early lunar missions, which are like flatter the better. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, all right. And then there's this great picture of Ir you can actually see Irwin reflected in Scott's visor as he collected samples. 
I quite liked. Yeah, can you see him there? Yeah, the, that's a good one. Yeah, pretty good one. I, again, one of the things that really gets me is trying to imagine us going back now with more computing power and better photo like photo Much taking better. in the palm of our hands right like mm. like you'd be they able used, to have full they were using film of course yeah but but now you'd be able to have full like 1080 60 video from every astronaut at all times. Yep. Just, I want us to go back. The sooner the better. Yeah. Come on, um, America. So, <clears throat> back at the lunar module, uh, Scott right. was finally successful on his second attempt at drilling the holes for the experiment. And during EVA 2, the crew also conducted soil mechanics experiments and raised the U.S. flag. This second EVA lasted 7 hours and 12 minutes. A great picture there of the LRV and the Falcon and the flag. And Scott saluting. That is a good one. And, and I like that there's like a mountain behind them too. Yeah, exactly. It's cool. Um... The third EVA began with retrieving a core sample. This took much longer than they had expected, unfortunately, and it limited some of the other activities they could do on the third EVA, but it did also prove to be one of the most important samples they brought home. And then we had some fun stuff. Uh, they did a feather and hammer drop experiment to show, it's basically a gravity experiment, to show, um, again, that... Uh, <laughs> Gravity works the same on any object, regardless of how uh, heavy it is and what environment it's in. And, uh, drum in the ETB. and you'll need audio for this one. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Oh, oh, a, a good picture there. I've got the... Beautiful picture, Dave. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Five <laughs> uh, that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. I love that. Isn't it great? That is just superb. So much fun. Like. <laughs> Like what is what is the simplest way we can just eh. it's that's kind of to me like the um, the stuff that uh, Hadfield was doing mm -hmm. in, in on the ISS right all of these little tiny experiments you guys m many of you might remember him putting water on a rag and then wringing the rag to show that water in zero G like show the, the surface tension of the water that just sort of envelops everything. Right. And it's that little bit of entertainment with the science that is uh, really important. important. It's really important. Yeah. I just, I, I love it. It's so cool. So the next one is um, <clears throat> so I like this picture quite a bit. You can actually see the bit of the tilt of the lunar module in this picture. Um, this is towards the end of the mission. Oh yeah, a little bit. 
It's not as easy to tell in that picture, but it, you can see it a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was definitely definitely had a bit of a tilt there into that little crater behind it. <laughs> um, whoops. Um, but thankfully, it didn't really cause any big issues. Um, so Scott then drove the rover to a position away from the lunar mine. Near the rover, uh, he planted a small memorial consisting of a plaque and a small aluminum statuette for the 14 astronaut or for 14 astronauts, both American and Soviet, who had lost their lives in the furtherance of space exploration. Um, it's hard to see the names on here, but it includes names like Yuri Gagarin and the entire Apollo 1 crew. And then we go on to another final resting place for the LRV. They took this picture after they dropped it off at its permanent home, where it still sit, still sits to this day. <clears throat> um, Falcos, I mean, besides the besides the footsteps that are right beside, like right beside the lunar where the lunar module was. All the footsteps are still there. Um, there were pictures that they took from orbit like a few years ago where you can actually see the footpaths that the astronauts took on the surface. So nothing's changed. <laughs> Didn't we show that um, last week? We did show that in one of the previous ones, yeah. Um, so um, this was the final resting place for the LRV. It's where it sits still. Hanging out there on the surface. And then we have, of all things, because they left a TV camera on the surface, we got a video of the liftoff from the moon, from the surface. So let's take a look at that. Just a warning, the audio is quite loud. Okay, I will, I will pre, uh, uh can we ironically, it's not actually the thing, it's not, of course, because it's a vacuum, there's not the thing that's making the noise. They play really loud music. Oh. <laughs> it's also only in one ear. That doesn't help. Pretty awesome. Can't wait to see that. Happened again. Um, so after lifting off the moon, the crew successfully docked with the command module. And we have a good picture here of Endeavor during the rendezvous, um, just before the rendezvous. Up in orbit, uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, I've been hard at work doing science in lunar orbit taking many observations and images of the lunar surface using cam cameras that were in a bay in the service module. The crew spent another couple days working on orbital science experiments and released a small satellite into lunar orbit to study plasma, particle, and magnetic field environment of the moon. It operated until 1973. Not bad. On the way back to Earth... Warden did the first ever deep space EVA to retrieve the film from the instruments in the service module because the service module is going to be jettisoned before they landed, so he had to go get the film from the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a picture of the EVA, and then we also have a video. Um, I recommend muting the audio, David, for the video because it's just really loud static. Okay. <laughs> Not helpful. So there's a good picture of him. Yeah, he's outside there working away on the side of the uh the side of the service module. Yeah, keep in mind, like, they're not, they were actually on their way home from, um, he was just out in, 
I would in the middle of space, walking around outside. <laughs> just that takes um <laughs> yeah trying to think of the word here um cojones no that doesn't sound very nasa like <laughs> spherical cloning devices <laughs> Oh, that was great. I'm definitely going to bring that up again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also like genetic transfer banks. Yeah. Oh, that that's pretty good. Dave, that one's a good one. I like that. I like that. But yeah, I, I'm sitting there. Like most, most DVAs in human history have been done either like on the surface of a planet or in orbit of Earth. And... Or not of a not in service of a planet on the surface of the moon or an orbit of Earth, um, and this one just kind of freaked me out a little bit because it's just in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's going to help you to be in the orbit of Earth, but at least you could see the Earth below you. I don't know. I think it would help. <laughs> anyway, freaked me out. Anyway, <laughs> um, so Endeavor, which was the name of the command module, successfully splashed down. Despite a single failed parachute on on the uh, during landing, it splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on August seventh, nineteen seventy one, and this is a video of the splashdown, which is interesting to see because of the failed parachute. Again, the audio is pretty much useless in this video. It's like just a helicopter. <laughs> So you can see that one parachute is uh, not cooperating, uh, not working. But thankfully, Apollo was designed to land in two parachutes. The third one was a spare, and uh, apparently they needed it. Just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Splish. And the and to end our show tonight, we have a picture of the crew back home after their after they were uh, plucked out of the ocean. And there they are. So this mission was uh, about two days longer than the uh, any of the other missions. <clears throat> um, and they were on the lunar surface for three days, as opposed to pretty much just a day or so before. Um, and the uh, the EVAs were about almost 19 hours long in total between the three of them. Um... So they got much more time on the surface and did a lot more exploration and they brought home a lot more samples than previous missions did. So it was a great, great exploration mission and science mission. And um, yeah, another great one for Apollo. So that is it for tonight. Hey, no problem, Coffee Whore. Uh, anytime. <laughs> um, You're very welcome, guys. Th thanks for joining us to to walk through the memories. Um, we've mm -hmm. got, we think we have one more of these um, in two weeks. We'll be doing Apollo sixteen and seventeen, and then some sort of an epilogue. Um, yeah. Well, we're going to cover the Apollo Soyuz project as well. Yeah. Um, which was the sort of after Apollo mission. And, uh, but that, you know, we were working towards wrapping up Apollo. Yeah. Um, eventually it'll happen. 
sometime in the future. And then we'll we'll be covering some other stuff as well, but uh, always yes. focused on space and science. And uh, yeah, join us. We're we're doing this every two weeks at around this time. Um, on sometimes Tuesdays. sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes a bit later, and sometimes we miss weeks. You basically have to follow us either on Twitter or Discord to find out when we do them because yes. it takes time to sometimes put them together. things but. get in the way, and that happens too, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, seriously, thank you all for, for hanging out. Um, yes. I'm going to go pass out now because it's well past bedtime. So uh, Yes, it is. Thank you, David. Hey, thank you. Good Thanks, night, everybody. everyone. Thanks, for everyone that uh, that followed us. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Bye, all. <laughs>